Our first speaker is uh, Don Ort from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. And just a few words about Don. I mean, he's actually a professor with two lives. I mean, he's both professor at the university, but also USDA research leader. And uh, he has been working in, in the field of photosynthesis for, for many, many years, and, and more recently also um, taking this out into the field um, to look at actually the effect of uh, climate change on, uh, on our crops. He's been uh, also very active in the scientific community. I mean, he's been ASP president of the American Society of Plant Biologists and, and then also the International Society of Photosynthesis Research. And uh, he's been editor-in-chief uh, of plant physiology for six years or so, seven years? Uh, seven, yeah. And uh, for, for, all, for all those of you who submitted papers, manuscripts during that time that were not accepted, and, uh, <laughs> he's, right and uh, he's been on the editorial board for annual reviews of plant biology actually for 10 years now. And uh, Don, without further ado, crops face, and I would emphasize, the uncertain future. Well, thanks for that introduction. I guess, Willie, um, we do have seven decision editors in plant physiology, so I didn't decline all your papers. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do this afternoon is I'd like to spend in the next 30 minutes and talk to you about some of the current and future, future challenges to agriculture, um, and also about some of the ideas that we have about how some of these might be addressed through um, new technologies in, in plant biology, and particularly in the area of photosynthesis. As other speakers have said, Willie has encouraged us to uh, give some background. And so what I thought I would do is start out by trying to put this in a global context so that everyone has an appreciation of the scope of the things that we're talking about. So I wanted to start here. And so many of you may recognize this. This is the global carbon cycle, as you might find it um, in a textbook. And I just wanted to emphasize a few things. And, that is, if we look just at the terrestrial side um, of this carbon, global carbon cycle, there's really three big pools of carbon. The first is there's about 800 gigatons of inorganic carbon in the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Um, there's a pool that's about uh, two-thirds that size that's uh, organic carbon in the form of plant biomass or the terrestrial plant biome. And then if you add these two together, it's about the size of this other pool of organic carbon that exists in the soil um, from past photosynthesis. And carbon flux among these three pools um, is due to you know, three really massive biological fluxes. The first is that terrestrial photosynthesis cycles about 15% of the total CO2 in the atmosphere every year. So about 120 gigatons. About 60 gigatons of that is immediately returned to the atmosphere in the form of autotropic respiration or maintenance plant respiration and growth respiration. And then the remaining part of it, um, and so the difference between this and this is, is normally called uh, net primary productivity of the terrestrial ecosystem. And on an annual basis, the rest of that is usually returned to the atmosphere uh, by microbial respiration and other kinds of decomposition, which in fact, folks, concludes us. And so the things that we eat were part, were part of this flux. And so for about the last 25 million years, up until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, this was all in equilibrium. And so the amount of, of CO2 that was taken out of the atmosphere by gross photosynthesis was returned, and the atmosphere was in equilibrium, and the concentration in the atmosphere was around 250 parts per million CO2. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we created another flux, and I guess you might call this a biological flux because we did it and we're biological. And so we included, we introduced this flux from the fossil fuel um, into the atmosphere. And so in 2011, and it's estimated that we're putting about seven and a half gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere um, from fossil fuels at about another one and a half gigatons due to land use change. And so. Um, you know, the, the various kinds of choices that we make, how we use land use. And I have to say, uh, being in photosynthesis, it's a little bit seductive to look at these numbers because, you know, this is a pretty small number compared to this. 
And so it makes you think it wouldn't take very much change in fluxes of photosynthesis and respiration to really negate uh, the CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere. And in fact, some of that happens. And so um, about 40 to 45 percent of all the CO2 that we're currently putting in the atmosphere stays there. Um, and about 60 percent of it's taken up. And so of this nine gigatons, about three of it's taken up in the, um, uh, in the, in the terrestrial ecosystem uh, by enhanced photosynthesis. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the basis of that as we go on. And so where, where is this net primary productivity in the terrestrial ecosystem? I don't think many of you will be surprised to find out that the tropical rainforests and the tropical savannas that surround these rainforests account for about 50% of the net primary productivity on the globe. But what might surprise you is that um, cultivation, uh, managed agriculture, is responsible right now for about 15% of the net primary productivity. And so right now we're using about 15% of the net primary pr productivity of the terrestrial ecosystem in agriculture. And so in, in the 45 years from 1960 to 2005, the population of the Earth increased 110%. And so it went from 3 million people to 6.5 million, and, and you know we're over 7 million now. Over that same 45-year period, crop production on globally increased 160%. So it went from 1.8 billion tons to 4 billion tons. An important thing to realize about that is 135% of that 160% increase was due to intensification. That is an increase in production on a land area basis. And so that went from um, about, that went from 1.8 tons per hectare to three tons per hectare average across the globe. So only 25% of it had to do with land recruitment. And in 2005, there were uh, 1,200 million hectares under cultivation. And what this graph shows is, in fact, that um, that has long since peaked. And so the total amount of land that was under cultivation peaked somewhere between 2,000. And so when the UN FAO forecasts that there's going to be a, a doubling in production by 2070 in order to meet agricultural demand, effectively what they're saying is that's all going to have to come from an increase in productivity, that is an increase on a land area basis. And so what does that mean? That means that we're gonna, we need to go from uh, eight gigatons of carbon under cultivation to 16. And so our footprint on terrestrial NPP goes from 15% to 25%. And so a quarter of all terrestrial NPP um, by this prediction is going to be needed for cultivation to feed the world in 2070. And so that's, just, um, that's a pretty big demand, and it's, it's a pretty big challenge. In fact, things aren't going in that direction, unfortunately. Um, and so this is percent increase uh, per decade versus decades um, ending in these years. And so only one of the 10 major crops in the world has sustained the decadal increase in crop productivity that they enjoyed during the Green Revolution, and that's maize. All of the other nine are in decline. And so, for example, the next two most important crops in the world, rice, you can see it in this decade, it was down to about a 17% increase. And for things like wheat, world production is actually decreasing. And so this kind of frames the question, where are the opportunities um, not only to reverse this, but really to change the slope right dramatically so that we can double productivity on a land area basis um, in the next 50 years? And so maybe we should talk about what determines yield. And so um, for many of you may know this equation. It's often called the Monteith equation. And it's, uh, it's an expression of what goes into harvestable yield. Um, and so the first bit is pretty obvious, and that's the total solar radiation, radiation that's available to the crop. And so that's the energy that it's, that's there. And then there's three genetically determined things that act on that to determine what the yield is going to be at the end of the day. And so this can change. Um, it changes a little bit with latitude, but importantly, it also changes over the length of time that you consider. And so if you consider the sun, or the, the solar energy that's just falling during the growing season, you're going to get um, a difference uh, in efficiency calculated than if you consider the whole year. And, and this will be important in a minute. And so I, as I said, this is acted on by 
three genetically determined things. The first is how efficiently does that crop in the field intercept that, that available radiation? And so one of the things that crop breeders have accomplished during the Green Revolution is to get crops to very quickly cover the land. And so um, they've selected for uh, very broad leaves that cover the land quickly so that they can intercept the light very quickly. The second thing is uh, the conversion efficiency. So of all that lights that's absorbed, how effectively is it converted into biomass? And so this is essentially net photosynthesis, gross photosynthesis minus the respiratory costs. And then finally, yield has to do with the bits of the plant that we want. And so the third genetic component um, is the, efficient, the partitioning efficiency or the harvest index. That is, of the dry matter that's above ground, how much of it are we interested in from an economic standpoint? And so for a wheat crop, it's the wheat grain. Well, let's look at interception efficiency. So for our top perform performing crops around the world, um, for the time that they're in the field, that is for the growing season, they already inter intercept 90% of the radiation that's available. And so there may be some potential there to increase that a little bit, but there's certainly no opportunity for doubling there. Remember what I already said about, um, about this notion, if you, if you increase the growing season, though, you will increase the available solar radiation. And so increasing growing season is an opportunity if it's allowed for by, for instance, global warming. So the second of these uh, um, partition efficiency of harvest index, for our major crops, that's at about 60%. What that means is for a wheat crop or a race crop or maize crop, 60% of the above ground dry matter we already harvest is grain. There's been a number of papers that have evaluated this and, and it's generally considered that the theoretical upper limit to that is somewhere between 62 and 67%. You gotta have stems, you, know, you gotta have leaves. And so, you know, once again, for our developed crops, the harvest index is very close to where the theoretical upper limit, and there's not really an opportunity f to go there. So I think you guys see where this is going. Um, you know, I do photosynthesis and what's left, right? And so, as I already said, photosynthetic efficiency is determined by gross photosynthesis minus respiration. And one thing that, that you do need to recognize is that during the Green Revolution, increase in photosynthetic efficiency, increase in this conversion efficiency played almost no role. And so in this doubling of productivity that we saw over a five decade period in the Green Revolution, it was all about interception efficiency and even more importantly about harvest index. And so is there opportunity? Is there opportunity for increasing photosynthetic efficiency? I think a lot of people have seen these numbers about how inefficiently plants convert energy into biomass. And so Note that these are annual, and so this is calculating from the total light that's available during the year, not just during the growing season. But you can see that um, this is one of the most productive plants in the world. It's elephant grass. You can see it produces you know, 80 to 90 tons per hectare, which is, was just enormous. It's, it's a tropical grass, and it has a conversion efficiency. That is total sunlight into biomass of 0.8%. If you want that on a growing season, you can, any of these you can approximately double. So it certainly appears that there ought to be opportunity here for a doubling. But to really evaluate that, it's useful um, to figure out what the theoretical upper limit really is. And so what is the upper limit for converting solar energy into biomass in the way that uh, evolution has evolved photosynthesis? And so um, this was in an annual view, a little plug. Let's, let's suppose we start out with 1,000 kilojoules of energy, solar energy. And so that's across the entire radiation spectrum. We immediately throw out more than half of that because it's outside of the photosynthetically active range. And so higher plants absorb light and can use it effectively to drive photosynthesis if it's between about 400 and 700 nanometers. So everything out in the infrared isn't energetic enough to dr drive higher plant photosynthesis. And so it's, it's immediately lost. So 51% goes away. We know that plants are green, and so they're reflecting some light, and, and so they lose anywhere from four to six percent due to reflection and transmittance. Photochemical inefficiency, um, a, a, a blue photon has 1.7 times more energy than a red photon. 
but all photosynthesis is driven by red photons, and so that energy is just thrown away in, in picoseconds uh, due to relaxation in the higher orbitals of chlorophyll. And so that's not available. And so now we're down to just 37%, and all this has happened in the first picosecond uh, after light's been absorbed. And then this bifurcates. It depends whether we're going to talk about C3 plants or C4 plants. In the case of C3 plants, for every CO2 they reduce to the level of carbohydrate, they use three ATPs and two NADPs. In the case of C4 plants, they use five ATPs and two NADPs. The reason being is they use that extra energy to pump CO2 into specialized chloroplasts to get a very high CO2 concentration around Rubisco. And we'll see the advantage of that um, in just a second. And so now we're down, and so this is a big loss. I mean, it's, it's not wasted energy. Remember, this is, all, this is all the energy that the redox energy and the electron transport chain and so on that drives things forward. And so it shouldn't be looked at wasted, but you know, it is the theoretical upper limit of, of the way photosynthesis evolved. Um, and so here we have C4, and the benefit that C4 gets now is they don't do photorespiration. And so I'll come back to this idea of photorespiration, but as many of you know, the Rubisco enzyme that fixes CO2 um, also occasionally uses an oxygen molecule rather than a CO2 molecule, and that's essentially anti-photosynthesis. And it starts an a energetically very expensive uh, carbon recycling pathway that, in the, in the case of a C3 plant, um, lowers photosynthetic efficiency under current conditions by about 40%. And so in this calculation, we've assumed that there's no photorespiration in C4 plants. There can be, but... but. And so um, then the last thing is just maintenance respiration. And there's no theoretical tie between maintenance and respiration, but empirically we know in order for a crop to grow and be robust, about 30% of photosynthesis has to go into autotrophic respiration. And so that brings us down to the upper, upper, upper theoretical limit for C3 photosynthesis of about 4% and for C4 about 5.3%. I might point out in passing that microalgae play by these same rules. And so there's nothing magical about microalgae. Um, the, the one difference is that um, the maintenance respiration is probably around 15% rather than 30%. But for a microalgae that has a bicarbonate pump, this is pretty much the upper limit, um, except that you add a bit on for respiration. If they don't have a bicarbonate pump, then this is pretty much the situation. They're like a C3 pump. And so when you see some of those very high numbers that you may be seeing in the literature for microalgae, they usually come from one of two places. One is up here in that they're doing the calculations not based on full, full solar energy, but on some portion of the photosynthetically active energy. And then the second place is right here, and that is that they're giving you efficiencies under saturating CO2 so they don't take this loss. And so I'm not making any judgment. I'm just saying, you know, in, in evaluating those numbers and comparing to higher plants, you, you have to take those things into consideration. So how well do plants do? Um, said for C3 plants, the potential is 4%. The mac maximum that's ever been observed across an entire growing season, and so these are the, the record yields that farmers get, is about 2.4%. So somewhere about 60% of theoretical. The average that farmers get um, under high input agriculture as we practiced in, in the United States or in Europe um, is about a third of record. Pretty much the same thing is true of C4 plants. Theoretical upper limit of 5.3%. Maximum observed across an entire growing season is about 60% of that. And then the average in high input agriculture actually realized by farmers is about a third of that. And so we could have a couple of conversations. We could have a conversation of why is this lower than this? Why is the average lower than the maximum? And so in that conversation, we talk about some of the things that we heard about this morning. We talk about uh, mineral nutrition. Uh, we talk about drought. And we talk about other kinds of environmental stresses. We could have a, con we could have a conversation about um, why is the maximum below the theoretical? You know, and that's primarily one I want to have this afternoon with just a couple of, of brief vignettes. You know, or we could have a very interesting conversation of, of what are the opportunities actually to raise the theoretical to, to new levels. Um, 
and, and there are some opportunities there. And so why is the maximum lower than the theoretical? Well, one of the big reasons is this, and that is at the top of any crop canopy, those leaves spend 75% of their day hugely light saturated. They're way out here. And so what that means is they're absorbing, they're absorbing all this light and they're not doing any more photosynthesis for it. And so that is the definition of, of being photosynthetically inefficient. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask are, are plants too green? Do they have too much chlorophyll? And the reason to ask that question is this. And so here's, here's our theoretical plant and it has a, a leaf area index of three, that it has three times the leaf area it does the ground area. And most fully green leaves, whether you're talking about crop leaves or whether you're talking about native leaves, have an optical density across this photosynthetic acti active range of about one. And so 90% of the light is absorbed by one leaf layer. And so what happens? Here you have full sunlight of 1,500 micro Einsteins. You're way out here. And so here's the full green one. You know, right here, it's dropped down to 150. And so this guy's way saturated, one leaf layer down. Photosynthesis is light start. Down here, you're down to 1%. And so we wanted to ask the question, well, what if you lowered the amount of chlorophyll? And so you didn't absorb as much at the top and you let it radiate through the canopy. And so um, in our model, this is what you come out with. Of course, at the top, it's the same, but now, uh, at 30% chlorophyll, you're only reducing light intensity by 50%, and now you're up here on the saturation curve. And as you go, and, and you get more benefits as you go down to the leaf layer. And so this is a real simple model. It's just when the light is overhead, and what you really want to know is what is the daily integral of photosynthesis as light goes across the sky, because it's really the daily integral of photosynthesis that is related to crop yield. And so, we set up a model to do this, and I just want to draw your attention um, to this figure right here. And in this case, canopy extinction coefficient is the surrogate for chlorophyll concentration. And so here's the concentration that you find in wild type soybean. And this is asking the question in this model, um, again, for a plant that has three leaf areas, what would the ideal chlorophyll concentration be to maximize the daily integral of photosynthesis? And so we did this simulation for 40 degrees north latitude, and what it says is you should reduce the chlorophyll in the leaf by about 70% in order to maximize chlorophyll. The thicker the canopy that you get, presumably the more and more you should reduce chlorophyll. And so this is one of the, the approaches that we tend to take is you know, first do a model, make a prediction, and then see if we can do a proof of concept experiment. The University of Illinois, we have the soybean germplasm collection for the United States, and within that collection are 72 light green mutants that we've screened through. And what you see here, um, this is a wild type Clark, which is an old cultivar of soybean, and these are two single gene mutations of Clark. This is Y11, and this is Y9. And as you can see, they're pretty light colored. And in fact, when you go in and look chlorophyll um, across the growing season, you can see the beginning of the growing season, the wild type is up here. We have a 70, 80% reduction in chlorophyll. And by the end of the season, it's about a 50% reduction in chlorophyll. And so this is a potential proof of concept. So we're looking here at the daily integral of photosynthesis. So this is the total amount of photosynthesis that occurs across the day as the sun moves across the sky. Um, and this is, lay, this is in the middle of the season. And so by this time, the soybean canopy has three to four leaf layers. And by this time, um, it's six to seven. And what you can see in a thick canopy, our, mo our model prediction is exactly what we see. And that is if you integrate the area under this curve and compare the light green to the dark green, so there's 30%, 33% more, more photosynthesis being done over that period. And so for the standpoint of crop plants, they have too much chlorophyll. Now these are mutants and we know that there are things wrong with this because they don't have any chlorophyll B. And so the way that we're going forward with this is that we've gotten, uh, we've done RNAi on Arabidopsis. We've downregulated each step in the biosynthetic pathway to find the ones in which we have the mo most robust plants and which we have uh, the least uh, architectural changes in the photosynthetic apparatus.
And so there's several, and so right now we are doing RNAi, RNAi of four different enzymes um, in soybean and in sorghum. Um, and so those, those will be moving along. We, we hope to have the first plants by next year. And so we heard a bit about Julian. He showed us the Keeling curve this morning, and we know CO2 is going up in the atmosphere, and we know by 2060 when the, when the UN FAO seeds, says we need to have double productivity, that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will be in excess of 600 ppm. CO2 fertilizes photosynthesis in C3 plants for the following reason. This is the reaction that Rubisco carries out. And so RUBP, Rubisco puts a CO2 onto it and makes two molecules of three carbon acids, which is why it's called C3. But about every three to four times it turns over, it makes a mistake, and rather than fixing a CO2, it fixes an oxygen, and in this case only make one PGA and makes two phosphoglycolate molecules. The reason that CO2 um, changes this equation is that these are competitive for the active site, and so as the CO2 concentration goes up, the probability of the oxygen reaction goes down. And so what can we expect? What can we expect in terms of how much stimulation will we get out of the elevated CO2 in the atmosphere, and how well is that gonna negate the other effects of global climate change, you know, all of which we think are gonna be negative, and so increased temperature, uh, increased tropospheric ozone, and, and so on. Um, and so this is a summary of all of the free air carbon enrichment experiments that have been done on, under field conditions um, on herbaceous C C3 crops. And this is the theory. And so there's very good theory that tells us how much photosynthesis should be stimulated by changing the CO2 concentration. In this case, it was changed from uh, 350 parts per million up to 550 parts per million. And so that's the way most of these phase experiment runs. But in fact, when you average over all of the phase experiments that are done, this is the answer that you get. Rather than the 35 to 40 percent, you get on the order of 22 to 24 percent under field conditions. But this does importantly translate through to increased biomass and increased yield. But it got us asking the question, why? You know, why is this so much lower than the theoretical? One of the things that, that I already mentioned in an earlier question, and that is that the CO2 concentration in, in, in the atmosphere when the ancestors to current crop plants uh, were adapted was very much lower than it is now. And so this is a record for the last half million years, and you can see that it averaged around 240 parts per million. It's a pretty good record that goes back 25 million years. Um, and for the last 25 million years, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has predominantly been between 200 and 250. And so it got us asking the question, you know, do, you know, do our C3 plants um, have the right rubisco in them? And the reason to ask that question is that there is genetic variability um, across plant species and how well rubisco enzymes can discriminate between oxygen and CO2. And that's expressed as the specificity factor. And so the higher it is, the better they are at it. And so you have red algae out here that are, that are way up here, or 120. Our C3 crop plants are around 90, um, and the Risco and C4 plants is somewhere around 75 or 80. But the other thing that this graph shows is for reasons that none of us understand is there's a trade-off. And that is for the more specific Rubisco gets and the greater its ability to discriminate for CO2, the lower its turnover rate. And so Rubisco is a pretty slow enzyme. I mean, it only turns over a few times a second. But what you can see is this red algae out here is turning over one and a half times a second, but the rubisco in a C4 plant is turning over seven or eight. And so the question becomes, you know, what do we want in a soybean plant when the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is 400 parts per million, you know, which it is now. And, and it's, it's a little bit of a complicated uh, answer because of this, and that is that if we lower the specificity factor 10 percent, and so suppose we take it from 90 down to 80, um, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen depends on what the light intensity is. So at low light intensity, the specificity factor is important, and, and the extra velocity that we get doesn't give us any payback, and, and we get a decrease in photosynthesis. At light saturation, on the other hand, 
um, specificity factor doesn't matter as much, and the velocity with the enzyme turns over. And so again, we put this into a model. And so here's our current soybean crop. Here's the daily integral of photosynthesis. And now we've taken in our, in our model a C4 enzyme, and we've put it into the soybean plant. So specificity factor of 82, but we've changed the KCAT from 2.5 per second to 7.3 per second. And for the daily integral of photosynthesis, we get a 17% increase. And so the theory on this is really good. If we knew how at this point to be able to take the maize rubisco and put it into a soybean plant, we can expect 15 to 20% increases in productivity right off the bat. Unfortunately, we don't need to know how to do that now, although there's a fair amount of money that's recently invested to try to do that. Of course, the great thing about a model is what you'd really like to do is you'd like to have, you'd like to have the C4 rubisco at the top of the plant canopy, the C3 rubisco at the bottom of the canopy, um, so, uh, so that you can take advantage of the specificity factor. Great thing about modeling, you can do that. Um, and so if you do that, you get, you get a 30% increase. Um, and so, uh, you know, why is it, why is it that we're um, even beyond Rubisco? Why is it that we're not seeing the stimulation that we expect? Well, one of the reasons is that um, at elevated CO2, although we see this increase in photosynthesis, I've already said it's less than theoretical, but there's also a global transcriptional downregulation of photosynthetic enzymes. And so if we take, if we take these plants and put them at 380 parts per million and measure photosynthesis, photosynthesis goes down. And that is because the plant has chosen to invest less in its photosynthetic apparatus. And what appears to drive that is the fact that um, the total uh, sucrose, fructose, and um, glucose concentration in the leaf has gone up about 60%. And there's already pretty well worked out mechanisms by which sugar signaling feeds back and downregulates photosynthesis. And so we're getting this downregulation of photosynthesis. And then another consequence of increasing the carbohydrate level in these source leaves is it tremendously stimulates respiration. And so um, respiration has gone up by uh, 30 to 40 percent. And again, there's this transcriptional upregulation, and so this is data from soybean, there's this transcriptional upregulation of all of these reactions in respiration, and there's more mitochondria. And so one of the things that all three of these things point to is that at elevated CO2, soybeans under their current condition don't have the capacity to move the uh, photosynthate out of the leaves quickly enough, and it's building up. And, and it, then it's feeding back on photosynthesis and downregulating it. So just some quick take-home messages. I told you that 15% of the total, total terrestrial net primary productivity is already tied up in agriculture, and that's going to have to go to 25%. Getting to 25% is going to have to be driven almost entirely by increases in productivity because there's very little land to recruit into agriculture. Without adaptation, um, we're not going to get the boost out of CO2 that um, we anticipate from theory and it's not going to be enough to counter the negative effects of, of global climate change. And then finally, it appears that um, the only component of the, of the yield equation that has an, uh, enough capacity um, is perhaps photosynthesis. So I, I think I should end there. Um, this last slide is, is just a, a more robust chart of the various kinds of opportunities to increase photosynthetic efficiency, uh, most of which I didn't, I didn't have a chance to talk about. So a uh, somewhat sobering account of the facts, and uh, I hope you all listen to that, and I wish the journalists would be in the room now, but they aren't. So we have time for a couple of questions. Thanks a lot for that great talk, Don. Um, to which extent do architectural models already um, affect your model calculations um, that go from solar irradiation to biomass yield? Because the, the canopy structure of a maize field and of a soybean field are different. Mm -hmm. 
um, the, the angle under which um, the sun is illuminating the canopy is changing throughout the day. Can you comment on that? Yeah, and so this is a very good question. And, and certainly um, the upright architecture that's bred into maize and is now being bred into rice has made a difference in terms of getting better light penetration in the canopy. And the way that they've taken advantage of it is to go to higher plant density. And so in the model that we're designing now in, in collaboration with, with uh, Zing Wan Zhu at and Chinese Academy, is that we are trying to make a more sophisticated model that takes in both leaf angle and leaf shape. And so a simple answer to your question is that we anticipate less of a boost um, in an upright grass from a lower chlorophyll than we do um, in something with planar leaves like soybean. Good question. I have a question about those um, the planned experiments with uh, down-regulating chlorophyll biosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we know enough about chlorophyll protein assembly and also the partitioning of the enzymes in different compartments to be able to sort of predict the outcome in terms of which chlorophyll proteins are going to be occupied? I mean, for example, if I uh, refer to some of our own work, in the case of the cyclase in Chlamydomonas, we have two isoforms and we had a mutant in one of them. And the surprising result was that we lost PS1, yeah. but not PS2. So how does one... And, and so I think the answer is no, we don't know enough. And, and, that's, and that's why um, we went to a Arabidopsis um, and, and we lowered each one. And so, for example, and, and this wasn't came as a complete surprise because it had been shown in tobacco, when you down-regulate chlorophyll synthase, which is this last step, it feeds back on the entire pathway. In fact, it feeds all the way back to chlorophyll AB protein. And so this really seems to be you know, one, of, one of the best targets. But you're right, it's empirical at this point. 